Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. It was a week ago, Jesus and his disciples were entering into Jerusalem, along with over two million other pilgrims. They were coming there for the Passover feast. And the, Jerusalem and the, the two small towns right outside of Jerusalem, Bethany and Bethphage, had over two million pilgrims cramming into them. And as Jesus came in, he was riding a donkey. And that's when the, the talk began. People began to point and, and whisper to each other, that's him. I think that's him. And they wondered, who? Who? Who is him? It's Jesus. Well, they knew the name. They didn't know the face. They knew the name because just a little over a week ago, Jesus raised a man who'd been, been dead in the grave for four days. He called for the stone to be rolled away, and Jesus shouted down death. It was a little more than a week ago that Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And out walked Lazarus, four days dead in the grave. Now, you raise somebody who's been dead for four days, people are going to talk. And the word traveled like wildfire. They knew his name. They didn't know his face. But they knew his name. So now as, as he and his disciples are entering in Jer to Jerusalem and he's riding on a donkey, the, the word travels that that's him, that's him. And they begin to break off limbs from trees and palm branches and they begin to wave them. Some folks even begin to pull off their clothes and lay them in the street. Now, when, when, when people begin pulling off their clothes, you, you know something powerful is going on. <laughs> you know, something big is going on. And, and, they're way, and they shout, Hosanna. Hosanna means save us. They say, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They start calling him king. And the disciples, there they are, part of this parade with, with thousands and thousands of people shouting out to him, calling him king. They know that Jesus is going to win in a landslide. There's no need for a recount on this one. I mean, this, they, it's sewn up. That this is, they, they, they were accustomed to being a part of those, those towns where people, they had to dust off the, the uh, shake off the dust from their sandals. But this is just the opposite. In Jerusalem, they're shouting, Hosanna. They're calling him king. And so they began to talk among themselves. Well, who's, who's the greatest? Who's going to be the, the, the first lieutenant? Who's going to be the second lieutenant? Who's going to sit at his right and his left? Well, Jesus didn't congratulate them for their ambition. They have the wrong kind of kingdom in mind. And they didn't understand. They didn't understand that at all. It wasn't until Thursday night that he called them together in an upper room. And he began to wash their feet. Now, kings don't wash feet. <laughs> kings have their feet washed. And he begins to wash their feet. Well, they don't understand that at all. And he begins to tell them about this kingdom. Jesus also said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Kings don't knock on doors. 
Kings have doors open for them. Or if doors don't open for them, kings have doors kicked down for them. Kings don't knock on doors. Kings don't wash feet. But here he is, ushering in a kingdom. And he's talking about a kingdom where it's a kingdom of loving service to God and loving service to one another. And if they didn't understand the kingdom the way he explained it in, 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 in the washing of feet, they understood it even less when he began to, to give them a, a loaf of bread and a, and a cup of wine. He told them that he was going to die. And that this, this bread and this, 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 this cup that it was a symbol of his body and his blood. And that every time they took in this meal, they were to remember, to remember that it was his body and his blood that was to live on the inside of them. Well, they began to protest. And, and as they began to protest, he told them that they would all deny him, that they would all fall away, and one of them would betray him. They didn't understand it. They didn't comprehend the kingdom that he was talking about. So when they they moved from that upper room into the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus began to pray, well, those closest to him fell asleep. Others wandered away. And one, one in particular, had a group to meet. It was Judas. He met with a group of temple guards and and Roman soldiers. It says there was a Roman cohort, a battalion of soldiers, and he led them to the garden. And as they approached into the garden, Jesus said, whom do you seek? There's the question. There's the question that's, that's woven throughout the Gospels. Whom do you seek? It's the same question that Jesus asked Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb. He says, whom do you seek? And the answer comes back, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus responds, I am. I am. Those two words, and with those two words it says they drew back and fell to the ground. A battalion of soldiers and temple guards fell to the ground with two words, I am. With that kind of power, you could imagine what kind of king he could be. What kind of... Of, of kingdom that he could initiate. So they asked the question again when they came t- to the feet. He asked, whom do you seek? Now, my hunch is, the fellow who asked the question the first time wasn't the same fellow who answered the question the second time. And my hunch is, the fellow who asked the, answered the question the second time, he answered it with a shaky voice. He said, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus said, I told you, I am. Let the others go. That's when the disciples, they ran, they hid. And that's when they took Jesus away, like a sheep being led to the slaughter. They had a mock trial for him that night. And the next day, they took him before Pilate. He had him beaten. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They made him carry his, his, his cross up a hill called Golgotha, or the skull. And that's where they nailed him to the cross. With a crown of thorns on his head, they taunted him. And in his dying breath, Jesus said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. In his dying breath was the word of forgiveness. The word of forgiveness for them and and that that word of forgiveness for for you and, and for me as well. From the cross, he breathed the words of forgiveness. You ask the disciples what happened to Jesus, they'd say, dead they weren't going to say, well, you know, he's, he's coming back in a few days. And, and that's when, no, nope, he was dead. And what do you do with dead? You bury them. And that's what they did. They buried him in a borrowed grave. They, they sealed it with a, 
the tomb with a stone. Now, it was the Sabbath day starting that night, so they couldn't finish the, the prep, preparing his body for the burial. So it was Mary Magdalene who came on the first day of the week while it was still dark. And when she got there, it says that the stone was rolled away. So she ran to get Peter and the other disciples. And Peter and John ran to the tomb. Well, John was younger, so he got there first, but he stopped outside the tomb. Peter didn't stop when he got there. He ran in the tomb, and John followed him, and it says the tomb was empty, and they saw and believed. Now, what they believed, I don't know, because they went there home. And it says that they, they closed the doors and locked them for fear. It was Mary Magdalene who stayed. She stayed there, and that's when Jesus approached her. He said, whom do you seek? The same question there again for Mary and for you and for, for me. Whom do you seek? And Mary thought it was the gardener. She didn't answer the question, what she said, thinking that he was the gardener. Tell me where they've carried him, and I will take him away. And then Jesus called her by name, Mary. That's when her eyes were open. That's when she recognized him. That's when she began to, to embrace him. And that's when she, she ran to tell the disciples. And Jesus meets them as well. Behind the closed doors. This is what it says in John 20, starting at verse 19. When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. What he offered them was, was peace. Peace, what he offers you and me. But because Jesus died on the cross, he forgave you and me. He, he wiped away all that is past. He wiped away all that is present. He wiped away all the sins that would be. And because he rose from the dead, what he did was he breathed his spirit in you and me, the living Christ. And because he is alive, he has a power, the power of peace in you and me. It's a peace that he gives us, not the way that the world gives. The world tries to give peace through peace. Through through parties, political parties, through partisanship, through dividing us and them. The world tries to give peace by separating enemies and allies and making sure that your enemies are defeated. The world tries to give peace by force. A force that offers anything but peace. But Jesus' words to you or me our peace. Even as the Father has sent me, I send you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of the risen Christ in, in you and me that has a power, a power that this world can't give to us. It's not the only time Jesus appeared to the disciples. It tells us that that same day that he appeared to Cleopas and another disciple on the Emmaus Road as they walked. And that he opened the scriptures to them. That's what his, his spirit does. It it's opens, the, the risen Christ opens the scriptures to us. And it says, that. It, and as they were breaking bread, that's when they recognized that it was Jesus who had walked with them all along. But it's not just in dribs and drabs, a few people here and there that Jesus appeared to. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that he appeared to 500 people at one time. And then it begins to name those people. The risen Christ met those disciples long ago, and he, he meets disciples today, here and now. And he meets us with a power, a power that we don't have on our own. There's a story that helps me here. It's a story of Corrie ten Boom. 
she wrote a little book called The Hiding Place. And it talks about how she and her family during World War II, that they began to, to harbor Jews who were hiding from, from the Nazis. They were found out by the SS. And she and her family were sent to a German concentration camp. It was there that her father died and her sister died. Well, Corey survived the concentration camp. And after the war, she began to go to a war-torn Europe to tell them about the forgiveness that Jesus offers, about the peace and the healing that, that Jesus offered to this war-torn Germany. After a speaking in Munich one night, she saw the figure of a man coming toward her, and this figure was, was hauntingly familiar. And then she began to, to see him, not in the, the, the gray jacket that he was wearing that day, but instead a black jacket and, and a black hat bearing the skull and crossbones of the SS. That he was, he was one of the, the cruelest of all the guards at Ravensbrück concentration camp. She remembered having to, to walk in, in front of this guard, naked, along with other women as he taunted and made fun of them. He stood next to a pathetic pile of their dresses. She remembered her sister dying at the hands of this man and others like him. And now he's standing before her with his hand out. And this is what he said. For all I you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. Well, it's obvious that, that he didn't remember her. He said, I was a guard there. Since that time, I've become a Christian, and I know God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, will you forgive me? Corey says that she stood there motionless, that she couldn't raise her arm, so she whispered a prayer, and still she couldn't move. She had been talking about forgiveness that night, and, and, and now here was someone who was asking for her forgiveness with, with his hand in front of her. Well, she knew what Jesus had done for her. And now she was called to forgive this man. So she, she whispered a prayer again. She said, Dear Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your strength, please. And there she says, a, a force, a force that was stronger than, than, than she had in, in her life and in her body, raised her hand, and as the two of them clapped, she said, clasped hands, she said that, a, that this healing warmth flooded her body. And that's when she said these words, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart, I forgive you. It's a gift. It's a gift that Jesus gave you and me on the cross he forgave you and me all that is past, all that is present, and all the sin that would be. He wiped it away for you and for me. And when he rose from the grave, he breathed his power in you and me for all who would receive it. John 1 verse 12 says, But to all who received him, who believe in his name, he gave power to become children of God. A power that... That, that breathes a new creation in us, a strength and a power that we don't have, a power that gives His peace and strength to forgive others, a power, a power of, of love and discipline. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. This power, it's available to, to you this day. It's available to all who receive. It's a power that this world can't give. Not the left, not the right. Not the really physically strong and able to force. It's a power that's given through the, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And because he is alive, that power is given to you. It may be that this day you know you need that 
power, that strength to have courage. Courage to keep going. Or maybe, you know, you need that power to forgive yourself. That there's something that, that's there in your past that's been wearing you down. And you've been rehearsing it. Maybe it's something you did or something that was done to you. He has power to wipe it away. Or it may be strength enough to forgive another. This morning, I want to pray with you that you receive the power of the risen Christ. And you know the gift of His forgiveness and the power of His peace. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, breathe on us this day and grant us grace enough to receive the power and strength of your forgiveness that as children we might be free free to grow into a new creation free to free to to love in a serving love not under our strength but under yours a serving love that that in your kingdom, that it, it's made real in and through us. Lord, we live in a broken world. We live where strife, fear are strong. How good it is to know that, that your, your power, your strength, it's, it's stronger than our fear stronger than our unforgiveness it's it's stronger than our lack of discipline breathe on us that power this day that we might live as your children a new creation it's in Christ's name we pray amen thanks again for joining us today um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission is to help people live a Christ-centered life. And we do it because we're biblical, we're welcoming, and we're compassionate. I'd like to welcome you. I'd like to welcome you here in person. We haven't been able to do that in a while. And I'd like to welcome you to 814 Mimosa Boulevard. We have a 9 o'clock service and we have two 1115 services. I hope that you'll join us here in person. Or if you can't do that, join us here on our website or through one of our social media pages. Thank you very much for joining us.